Elon Biz Analysis. Hands up who's read the Isaac Walton, Walterman Elon autobiography. Is it auto? Yeah. Okay. The, the one. Bi what? Biography, not autobiography, yeah. Um, so I think you, you should read it. Even if you don't like Elon, read it. If you're not that interested in him, still read it. Uh, you're, there's some, lots of learning points. I found it slightly boring, but that's only because I've read every book, every, watched every interview he's ever done. So I didn't really, like, you probably found the same, Andy. You probably, yeah, there's loads of repetition. There's probably no new stuff that you, you read from it. I, I couldn't really. The Ashley Barnes, yeah. So, however, I thought, okay, I'm just always be open-minded. Um, let's try and glean some key learning points that go through his whole book. Because really, Isaac was, he was fascinated with how Elon moves. And just like, you know, you, if you ever watch a Joe Rogan podcast with Elon, Joe Rogan's constantly fascinated, like, how do you do so much stuff? Like, and that's the same, and like, he runs so many big businesses. I mean, a lot of people don't realize that a lot of the mini businesses with, under, that fall under Tesla that you don't consider a business are actually huge, gigantic businesses, businesses in themselves. If the Tesla supercharging network was a single company on its own, it would be an S&P 500 company. It's ridiculous. And he's just fired, how, like, was it 10% or more of his staff? And, and he's still increasing it. Like, the amount of revenue just the, the supercharging network um, produces is, is nuts. And so ultimately, when you look at every business he's done, everything from Zip2 to, to, to X, PayPal, um, yeah, and Tesla, he's got five simple steps. Remember, he starts with first principle thinking. He goes from the core basic building blocks of any decision, like what is the most logical thing, and move forward. Sorry, it's quite scratchy, these things. Um, and, he has, and he's ruthless in doing it. Now, first of all, with the ruthlessness, a lot of people think that he's cutthroat, he has no heart or emotion, and he is ruthless. And yes, if, if you don't understand the contact, context behind him, it does seem that way. But his justification, whether you agree with his justification or not, this is, how he, this is what he, he believes. He believes that he, his sole being and existence is to push and forward progress humanity in whatever way that he can do, whether it's from solar to rockets to cars, self-driving, robots, whatever. He's trying to push humanity forward as much as possible. And that is much greater than him. It's greater than all of his companies combined. And that is his sole driving cause. So when he, and then that's the thing that he's always thinking of. So if he has to fire 10,000 people because that a certain department is being inefficient in his eyes, the, 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 the overall mission is far more important than the opinions and emotions of 10,000 people he's about to fire or 10% of a department, or, or whatever it may be. So yes, he, sometimes he goes on massive firing um, sprees, and people think he's cutthroat. And yes, he may be. But that's one of the reasons why he's done so well, because the, the mission is more important than the, than the people in it, unfortunately, for those. So first thing is always question the requirement. Um, and he was saying that the worst thing you could ever do is get a, an engineer to refine a process um, because they all think the same way. They all got their university degrees, blah, blah, blah. And so he's found great success with questioning every single thing that his engineers say. Um, he'll then just randomly delete any process he can or delete parts of a vehicle, parts of a what, what not. Um, he, and he may do that physically or he may do it intellectually and go, yeah, we're not doing that anymore. Because if it is relevant, something will break eventually, and he'll, and he'll be like, ah, yeah, we did need that. So he'll rapidly delete processes as fast as he can, and he'll only know if he's made a mistake if that deletion has caused an issue, for down, whether on a simulation or in a rocket blowing up. Um, then, once he's got to the point where he's not 100% certain, you should, again, that should be another step, never be 100%, it's good enough to go. We've all heard that before with business. But once you're, you know, you, you've mitigated as many things as possible and, it, and you have 
proven success that it is working to a degree, then you just need to simplif simplify and optimize. Simplify the design and optimize it, then simplify the manufacturing and output of it, of it all. Once you've done that, you then need to accelerate the cycle time. As in, OK, how, how quickly can we get the next iteration of whatever, the, you know, let's take Starship. How quickly can we get the new version of the, the, the Raptor 9 uh, rocket, um, the Raptor uh, rockets out, or, or Starship, full stop? What is it, Starship 4 or 5, which is about to launch? 5 is about to launch. And, and then you automate. Once you've nailed those four, then you can automate. And what he says is that everyone always goes, in fact, they don't do that. They don't do that. In fact, they, they go straight to automate as soon as possible. And he's made that error before. Like with one of his um, Tesla factories, he went straight to the automate process because he thought, oh, I need to automate stuff. But what he realized is that he bought the, a whole bunch of robots to try and automate car production. And he realized, shit, I didn't actually do any of the simplifying and optimizing. And, and so he was automating bad stuff to the point he got rid of like half the, the robots in, in the machine, went back to humans and went back to the basics. Um, and so to, to, to accelerate, simplify, automate. Oh, there's one more point I was going to make. Yeah, and then, and then once, you, once you do automate, that's how you scale. And he, not many people know that, but he has, I think he's built, so if you take the sort of, I think it's the top 20 biggest buildings by volume on the planet, I think he's built five of them. It's just, it's just absolutely not, obviously not him, but he is, through his companies, Tesla, you know, the gigafactories and whatnot. And he is the fastest builder on the planet. So I think the gigafactory in China, I think is the biggest building by volume ever. And he built it in a year. It was a rice paddy field and went from rice paddy field to fully functioning factory in under a year. Biggest by volume. I think it's a quarter of a mile wide. And how many miles long? It's over a mile long. It's nuts. The fact that you can drive a quarter of a mile sideways, and that, that's its width. And then, um, yeah. So as I said, the cause is greater and more important than people's feelings. That's a big one for him. Leaders should lead from the front, engaging with all team members and being willing to tackle problems at every level. So. Yeah, uh, this is why he will, you know, during times of crunch, he will literally work 18 hours a day on the floor and then sleep under a desk. Um, he will literally work in the factory and people are, like stepping around him. Um, so oh, I found this is a complete random factoid. Do you know why all the ancient murals on cathedrals and stuff, all the men have tiny willies? Uh, does anyone know? So I had to fact check the hell out of this. So I was like, no way. So in the olden days, <laughs> it was a very chauvinistic, male-dominated do uh, world, right? Yeah, we, we can all agree with that. It, it was all about the men. No one cared about the women, etc. And then it was a Greek philosopher. I, I can't remember the name. It wasn't Aristotle or Plato or, any of, or Socrates. It was none, none of the big ones. But somewhat, there was a Greek philosopher that said um, the whole pro he says something along the lines of um, the whole point of procreation and sex is to, off, um, to procreate and there is no need for women's pleasure in sex. Um, and, and so I think it stemmed from that. And, then, and from that guy there basically said people with large phalluses are grotesque and ungainly and all that sort of stuff. And f so for the most part of human history, small willies has been the thing to have. <laughs> Steve is like, yes! <laughs> and it's only been in, in modern culture, like literally in the last hundred years or so, that that whole narrative has flipped. So yeah, my internet search history was a bit weird during that. <laughs> Why are small willies cool? Like, <laughs> all that sort of stuff. So um, yeah, it's just a random factoid for you. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> Management as flat as possible. He hates middle line managers, and he says that MBAs are the scourge of any business. 
If you want to ruin a business, hire an MBA. Um, and I agree with that entirely. Um, and that anyone in the business can talk to Elon. Anyone in his business can, t can literally email him and he doesn't want any form of sort of comms hierarchy. So in the military, it's the opposite. If I wanted to talk to my boss's boss and I just went straight to my boss's boss, I'd get absolutely buggered because there's a chain of command, chain of hierarchy, etc. It's, you know, it's going behind your superior's uh, back to... So, yeah, there's, there's, it's completely flat comms and flat for hierarchy. And all man managers have to do at least 20% of work time doing the do. So he doesn't have MBAs as random middle line managers. The middle line managers are the engineers. And he doesn't like camaraderie within the workplace. Because he's found from earlier iterations or staff um, cohorts is that it can hinder constructive criticism. So it's important to be honest and open with colleagues, even in tough times. Obviously, he hasn't exactly followed suit because he recently had two babies with a Neuralink employee. But hey, he's got 12 kids now. Um, that's, yeah, it's nuts. <laughs> attitude, and I've, I've said this many a time, attitude is more important than experience when hiring. As skills can be taught, but a negative attitude is seldom changed. If anyone's ever employed people, you can attest to that. I'd much rather hire a very ambitious, hardworking 18-year-old than a complete cuckoo, left-wing university graduate that expects everything under the sun and, you know, smoothie makers and, yeah. Um, it was interesting. I was chatting with a, a recruiter the other, oh, I say the other day, it's probably more like a month ago, and she was saying that the number one question that um, Gen Z employees ask their employers in the interview process is, what things do you have in the workplace to help protect my mental health? And I was like, are you what? Is that a joke? He was like, no. Most Gen Z employees going in a job interview will go, what will you do for the protection of my mental health? Wow. If that was me, I'd be like, thank you very much. Have a great life. But we are not for you. There is no mental health protections here. Lewis will abuse you at some point. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, really? Yeah, that's an instant disqualification. Instant disqualification, yeah. That's nuts. Can't wait for AAAs. Then everything's solved. Gen Z can go and be snowflakes somewhere else. Um, mistakes should be encouraged, um, or expected and encouraged, but egos should be set aside. So, yeah, like you should never tell someone off for a mistake, ever. Um, because you know that deep down that person's beating themselves up a lot harder than you're beating them up. I know every time I've made a mistake I berate myself so yeah and normally they won't make the same mistake twice. If they do then something's wrong. Life should be played like a game. I was like Gee, it's like he's taking stuff from the WAP here and he's putting them in his own book. Um, life should be played like a game, be proactive, optimize every opportunity and take breaks when needed. So contrary to common belief, he does actually take breaks. He doesn't do holidays. He takes jollies. Um, so, but yeah, he does do, do breaks. I know the media have portrayed him as like always working 18 hours a day. That's not true. He does crazy stuff. Sorry? And playing. Done, oh, what was the other one? No, Diablo. Yeah, he's one of the world's best Diablo gamers. It's nuts. Um, Setting a sense of urgency is the operating principle. <laughs> Motivates everyone to work as hard as they can to achieve the grand mission, or a grand mission, whatever it may be, whether it's Neuralink or whatever. So, um, yeah. There's some great pictures online. <laughs> I didn't make these, I just found them. So, um, and I think that's good. And here's the key thing. All employees must also believe in the grand mission. So if you speak to anyone that works at Neuralink, they will all repeat the same stuff. We're here to try and help the disabled, those that are paralyzed, the quadriplegics, uh, those that are blind and deaf. We want to completely cure that. And Neuralink's not far. They, they can cure blindness uh, and deafness. They're, they've just, they're being hindered at the moment by 
government, um, the, whatever their regular, it's not the FDA, it's the other one. So, sorry? I can't, yeah. But they're very slow in letting him do human trials. So they've only got one person that's new linked up at the moment, Roland, and who's a great success. So yeah, and I think that's, that's, a, that's a big thing. And this is, okay, going back to the last wedding I went to last weekend, it was a military wedding. It was a proper hoity-toity army wedding. Everyone was army officer there. And it's interesting because the military are very good at this last bit here. Everyone must believe the grand mission. And the problem that you can get into when you, let's say, indoctrinate a workforce into a, a singular point of view or focus is that you can become myopic as an organization. So even me mildly questioning what's going on in Russia was a very taboo topic at the wedding. <laughs> and, and like, because all these soldiers are like, oh, the, Rus the Russians, you know, the Russian bear, you know, they're evil, they're, they're doing this, they're doing this. I was like, wow, that's quite a polarizing, yeah. It, 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 they, they all strongly, that, I would say brainwashed into believing that the Russians are bad and what we're doing is perfect and that the poor Ukrainians are completely victimless, yeah, yeah victimless, like, yeah, other way. But I, I found that interesting, that it was like one, talking to one soldier was identical to talking to any other soldier at that wedding. I was like, shit, that was me in the Air Force many years ago. This is my favorite part of a realization. In-house competing teams on the same task is the magic gravy. It enables rapid iteration and innovation, so much so that incumbents can't keep up. So much so that um, Elon takes the piss out of Warren Buffett for talking about moats. So Warren Buffett for years has said, oh, the best thing about a business is having a moat so no one can you know, copy or in innovate in your niche. Elon was like, no, 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 no. If you iterate and innovate fast enough, you don't need a moat because you're moving faster than your competitors can copy. So if you look at China's space program, have you seen their recent rockets? They look very much like SpaceX rockets, but from like five years ago. They're trying to do a Starship equivalent, and that's failed terribly. So even if China is blatantly copying Starship, they're failing because they're not iterating properly. The Chinese are dreadful at innovation, but they're great at mimicry um, and optimization. They're very good at optimization and copying at grand scale, but they can't, there's very few occasions where they've created novel innovations. Um, no. Oh, nice. Yeah, it's clean, yeah. Yeah, it's nuts. Um, and, he, and going back to the ego thing, there was a video of him walking around Starbase with Tim Dodd, the everyday astronaut. And Tim was like, well, why don't you do this, this, and this? And he was like, shit, we that. Yeah, shit. And guess what? The next version of Starship had those, those changes. So he's not too big to go, oh, no, I know better than you. Um, so here's the, the, the cool thing with this one, is that when they were doing the Starship development, he had one team in Florida and one team in Texas all, all doing the same project, and he was basically competing those two, two teams against. So he separated them by distance, and they weren't allowed to talk to each other. And he was basically going, right, whoever wins gets the, is the A team and gets pay rises, blah, blah, blah. So within his own company, he was having employees like, really gunning to win, the, you know, to develop the best thing. And then when the thing was completed, when Star it was a particular part of Starship, then he was like, okay, I'm gonna take this team, but then he picked the best parts of the, of the loser team. And then I'm not sure what he did with the losers, but <laughs> well, yeah, we'll see. Yeah, the book doesn't cover that bit.